race relations is transformed. It's transformed by the actions of its staff workers against the, 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 the position of its council. They were rich people, rich trust people, Ford Foundation type people. Sivanandan was at the head, was in the, a leading voice in, uh, in, the, in the making of that transformation. In 72, he becomes, takes the position of director of the Institute of Based Relations. He's also the senior librarian at the Institute of Based Relations. And he's the editor of its journal then called Race. In 19, by 1974, it's two years after his transformation, the journal Race is transformed into the journal that you know today, Race and Class. And its strap line says that it's a journal for black and third world liberation. This journal gathers with the staff, they gather a board of radical scholars and those connected to solidarity movements. There's an essay to be written sometime, Josh, anybody else who's interested on the membership of the editorial working committee of the race and class down the years. So now for the racing chronology. In 1978, Cedric Robinson sends race and class an essay entitled The Emergent Marxism of Richard Wright's Ideology. Race and class is the first journal after many turned, have turned it down, not to qu be querying the political stance that uh, Cedric is taking in that piece. Cedric was amused, I'm reminded by Jenny, by the unprofessional typing and messy handwriting envelope which comes with acceptance to him of his piece, but he's really pleased with the political acceptance. That was 78. In 1979, just look at the consistency of Cedric. Racing Class publishes Cedric's The Emergence and Limitations of European Radicalism. This is essay, is an intimation of the coming of the book that's going to be Black Marxism. One year later, in 1980, the year of the national, nation, nationwide riot, race and class uprisings in the, in, in the United Kingdom called riots, Cedric invites Siva, Colin and me uh, Siva, me, and indeed uh, Musindo Munipembe, a producer of a film, to show the banned 1978-79 film, Doc Black's Britannica, already mentioned, and to give uh, some talks at Santa Barbara. I've told you a little story of what happened on the platform there. And then in 1980, there's a race class in the state conference. I think Josh may have just referred to this, maybe not organized by Mike Cole and Bob Skelton at Brighton Polytechnic, bringing old guard liberal scholars, people like the sociologists, John Rex and Robert Moore, uh, people from the Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies here and race and class people, which now includes Cedric on the editorial working committee of race and class. This is 1980. We're all on the stage uh, talking with a progressive audience of scholars and activists. In 1980, same that same year, Race and Class publishes the essay, Domination and Imitation, Halla and the Emergence of the Black Bourgeoisie. It's an essay by Cedric, which he takes at the centerpiece, a seminal film by the West African uh, filmmaker, Osman Semben, published in Race and Class. 1981, one year later, Race and Class publishes Cedric's Coming to Terms, The Third World, and The Dialectic of Imperialism. I came to Cedric over this, this essay. It, I grabbed it and snatched it into a course that I was teaching at the Polytechnic of North London, a course which was called Underdevelopment in the World System, a course looking for analysis and theory to, and, the, and theoreticians to support the thesis that I was pursuing in the, in the course that I was teaching on the, to those students. Cedric's article was, as they say, a godsend. Jenny reminds me that during 1981 and 82, the Robinsons were in England while Cedric did research in Cambridge. And during this time there, you know, there was much personal interaction with us institute people, including on the tennis courts at Radwinter. Siva was also a keen tennis player. And in the home of Siva, and indeed at my home here in London. In 1982, I'm still back to race and class, our relation, special relationship. Race and class publishes Cedric's Class Antagonisms and Black Migration, a review, a review essay. In 1983, Cedric's big book, Black Marxism is published in the UK. In 1984, Race and Class publishes Cedric's Indiana Jones, The Third World and American Foreign Policy in Race and Class. In 1985, 
Racing Class publishes Cedric's The African Diaspora and the Italo-Ethiopian Crisis. In 1986, Racing Class publishes Cedric's The American Press and the Repairing of the Philippines. In 1990, Racing Class publishes Cedric's W.B. Du Bois and Black Sovereignty. 1990, Cedric was at Oxford, uh, and you can see Josh's book for the breakdown on the kinds of things he was up to while it, during that, that time at Oxford. In 1993, Racing Class publishes Cedric's The Appropriation of Fanon, terrific essay, fine piece. In, 19, in 1993, 1994, sorry, I'm trying to hurry through this chronology. Race and Class publishes Cedric's The Real World of Political Correctness. And then in 1995, Cedric takes part in the IRR's London Race, Class and Black Struggle Conference. This was a conference held on the day, on the same day as the Million Man March in the US with people like Jan Kariru, Manning Marable, Barbara Ransby, Siva, uh, and others are uh, joining us on, the, on our platform. In 1998, Racing Class publishes Cedric's Black Exploitation and the Misrepresentation of Liberation. In 2003, Racing Class publishes Cedric's The Mulatto on Film, Hollywood, and the Mexican Revolution. In 2005, Racing Class publishes his The Black Middle Class and the Mulatto Genre. Jenna reminds me that uh, in 2004, Cedric and Elizabeth attended a celebration in the House of Commons uh, held on the occasion of the 30 years of the transformed race and class. Uh, and, and entertainingly, he was given a tour around the Palace at Westminster, which is the Houses of Parliament in London, by Jeremy Corbyn uh, of later fame. Then in 2004, again, there is a symposium at Chicago and Santa Barbara to celebrate Cedric's work. And the papers are later to be published in Race and Class. So that in 2005, Cedric publishes, we published Cedric Robinson and the Philosophy of Black, Black Resistance, a special issue of Race and Class entitled Cedric Robinson and the Philosophy of Black Resistance. 2015, Cedric visits the UK again uh, to give a series of lectures at different London universities. It was his last visit to the UK. I've done that lovely rundown, and I thought I'd do it in this way because this demonstrates that this was no ordinary relationship between Cedric and Elizabeth and the Institute of Race Relations. Of course, the IRR and its journal were useful to Cedric quite clearly, but I think that our UK imaginary, our England-based imaginary of black as a political color was an attractive provocation for him, distinct from, but entwined with his black as an African, radical tradition. And as to how much we loved Cedric, I'm nearly finished. I'll just read you, I thought, Sivanandan's contribution to the 2004 Santa Barbara celebration of Cedric's work that I mentioned just now. Here's what Siva, how Siva, what Siva said. At the House of Commons on the 9th of September 2004, we celebrated 30 years of race and class as a journal serving the cause of black and third world liberation. And of all those who were able to come to the event, one of our most honored and loved guests, one of our truest friends, was someone who has worked with us for 25 of those years, Cedric Robinson. Except that he and Elizabeth were not guests. They were family in the deepest sense. For race and class, for us and for Cedric and Elizabeth, his relation class is not just a journal with high ideals. It is a network, a family of I can't think of a better term, says Siva, of organic intellectuals. It's a family that has made itself across continents, across political traditions, uniting those whose commitment is both to understanding the world and to changing it. Cedric, in writing some of the finest analyses of the interplay of race, class, and the black tradition in race and class, was one of the first to demonstrate in practical terms what is implied by one of our core principles, thinking in order to do. This was at a time when the very survival of race and class was at stake. And metaphorically, Cedric's input into race and class has helped shape it into what it is today and helped keep it true to its founding principles. I've said, says Sivanandan, that Cedric exemplified thinking in order to do. 
And part of that doing is not only the activism, the principled fight after fight, which I know he carried on in and outside the university, but also the encouragement to new writers, writers from different communities who are attempting to transform their own realities. Another race and class principle, writers whom race and class has been proud to publish work with. Many of them, Sivis student, uh, 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 Cedric students. And at a time when we are besieged in an information age, Siva goes on, with the cultural propaganda of globalization in the films we watch, the TV programs we are fed, the icons we are foisted with, Cedric has also helped us to give us cultural eyes to see with, whether turning our attention to neglected third world filmmakers or exposing the bedrock of racism that runs through much mass entertainment. Siva wrote, I am particularly pleased to be able to participate even from across the Atlantic in this event, not least because the recognition that is owed to Cedric as one of the finest scholars in the US Academy today and as one of the finest that black America has ever produced is so long overdue. Modest to a fault, totally lacking in the self aggrandizement that has brought much lesser talents to public prominence, Cedric has never compromised his values or principles or academic integrity. And while this may have brought him frequent battles with the powers that be, it has won him the enduring respect and affection and power of influencing and inspiring many generations of students. I'd say that Joshua's, this is me now, Joshua's intellectual biography, and the clarity of its exposition now greatly facilitates the project of influencing new generations to which Siva referred. I found reading the book, Josh, exhilarating. Thank you. On to whoever's next. Thanks, Colin, I think that's me. Um, hi, everyone. Um, big thank you for people who put this, this event together and logistically, technologically, emotionally. Um, I've been tasked with kind of talking about Cedric's relevance for today which kind of it's not really doable in 10 minutes but we'll start i mean the first thing to start with is that josh has done um this book is amazing pick it up he's done an amazing job of kind of situating cedric robinson in a conversation that starts before him and that will carry on after him but having been informed by his life and his work and i think it, it's just a wonderful text that josh has come up with and it does a lot of things right so it kind of situates um, Cedric's work in a, in a wider milieu that we sometimes don't associate with, with his work, especially in the UK, because in a sense, Cedric Robertson is like an outlier to some of the kind of positions that we would embrace in, in, the, in the contemporary moment. He is not essentialist enough for some people. He's not non-essentialist too much for others. And in some ways, what Josh has done is really put him back into, into his kind of correct um, context for us to really appreciate. Um, I'm going to start with an anecdote, right? Cedric Robertson's work is in some ways always prone to um, starting a debate. So on my Twitter feed, just before this event, a few days ago, there was a, a comrade who, who is a very good thinker in his own right, who was rallying the cry for third world Marxism and then said, but don't come at me with Cedric Robinson's anti-Marxism, right? And I thought this was quite interesting. I was seeing this thread and I was like, hold on, that doesn't even make sense. And then some other comrades rightfully pushed back and said, where is this in Cedric Robinson's work? Where is this anti-Marxism? And to be fair to the initial comrade, he, he took his position back after, after being corrected on his knowledge. But that in a sense is a weird debate because Cedric is a dialectical thinker. Uh, a dialectical thinker that makes us think or gives us the tool to think dialectically in our present moment. For me, I'm just going to kind of rattle off what I think are the kind of key contributions that I've taken from Cedric Robinson's work and then maybe kind of wrap up with looking at how they kind of interact with the contemporary moment, where, where, we, where we could possibly go. And I guess I'd start with the fact that Robinson's biggest, Cedric's kind of biggest kind of contribution for me has always been the way that he ch he shows that the mirror of production that so sort of guides Marxist revolutionary thought, well, the mirror is incomplete or it's distorted or even it's broken. That the differentiated economy 
that gave rise to capitalism, which includes the enslaved, the indentured, and the waged, and, and, and other forms of labor, is itself problematic to be read through a very simple A plus B equals C idea of revolution. That if we have a differentiated economy based on racialization, then we have differentiated forms of resistance that necessarily don't match up with our ideas of what a revolution should look like or what a revolutionary subject should look like. And I think when you take that on board, using Cedric's work to rethink your own, it's actually, it's actually mind boggling. It starts to really mess with your conception of both the past, the present and the future. And I think Josh makes a really good kind of analogy here in his, throughout the text about how Cedric reflects on time and how time is nonlinear in, in his work. And I think that's, it's really interesting to see the black radical tradition and the history that Cedric unpicks in, in places like black Marxism, not so much as a linear history, but more so as the kind of, you know, when we look up at the, the stars at night, the light that we're seeing emitted happened centuries, thousands of years ago, and we're only really seeing their effects then and there in that moment. And I think, if anything, Cedric's work takes us to looking at how the Black radical tradition shapes our contemporary moment, but not, not in a linear way, but rather as that kind of synchronic idea of looking up at the night sky and seeing events that have already happened. Um, for me, the kind of big thing that Robinson's work does is to, is to really shift our idea of what revolution would mean. My favorite, my favorite part of Black Marxism, right? When Black Marxism has got to be the only book in the world that everyone has read, but about 90% of the readers probably don't understand or haven't read, right? And I claim that they haven't read it because everyone's read it, but the renditions of it normally are not very correct. I think uh, Josh has a very good kind of line in it, uh, the book about everyone claiming to have read the book. But my favorite kind of passage of the book comes after um, Cedric's narration of W.B. Du Bois's work. And he talks about the shocks to Western imperialism happening at the periphery, but that the Western intelligentsia was unable to keep up with what the real realities of the Indian mutiny, the Boxer Rebellion, the struggles in Sudan, Algeria, Morocco, Somalia, and Abyssinia, what they really meant for um, Marxism, what they meant for revolution, what they meant for the idea of the proletariat. And it was this idea that revolutionary consciousness um, formed in our kind of struggles with imperialism via nationalism was not something that could just pre, be predefined in a, in a revolutionary subject that just mirrored production. It actually mirrored the reality of what he called racial capitalism. And that gave us a kind of non-perfect, um, non-Marxist uh, in its kind of very strict sense, revolutionary subject. And that changed the way that we had to think through revolution. And I think that's the kind of contribution I take the most from Cedric's work. And I think is really most important about the black radical tradition being a form of humanity that couldn't be crushed under the weight of Western imperialism through enslavement, through colonialism and the imperial era, but who negated that, the, the, the domination of Western racialism with its own form of life that couldn't be crushed, refuses to go away. It is in a sense, a, a, a sense of spirit that cannot be crushed by, by domination. And so if we bring all of that into the present, I, I think what Cedric's work does is it does a number of things for us. For those who work in the intelligentsia, for those who work in the terms of anti-racist intelligentsia, um, the biggest confusion of, of Black Marxism as a book is it's actually not about Black Marxists, right? It's about thinkers who stumbled upon the Black radical tradition, which was the agency and humanity of those who resisted um, Western colonialism, imperialism, um, and tried to reflect through Marxism a way of, of, of changing the strictures of revolution. And in some ways, what Cedric's work always forces us, those who work in intelligentsia, is that it reminds us that we are normally behind the times, that it is the people and the masses who are really pushing forward with things, and we should pay more attention to them rather than our own insular discourses. So that would be the kind of key lesson that we take from Cedric's work. The other would be to think beyond the global north. 
or the first world or Europe or the West or whatever you want to define it as, as thinking beyond that and looking at the periphery and looking at the struggles at the periphery and how, in a sense, the revolutionary activity that's happening on the periphery may not match up with our ideas of, of a straightforward revolution, or the abolition of private property or simply the redistribution of wealth, but asks us to think um, with those subjects around their struggles, around their future. And I'll return to that just at the end. But reading the end of Josh's book, um, there were two kind of provocations that I kind of really took away from it. And that was, what was Cedric working on towards the end of his life? And what does the kind of overall, uh, overall of his work kind of say to us? One thing that Josh talked about was Cedric was working on the history of fascism and the West and the, the relationship between the Western social order and fascism. And in one quote he has, he has from Cedric saying, the West is um, pathological and fascism is its, uh, are its symptoms, um, which I guess is hyperbole in the way it's been taken in the text. But there is something about the idea of fascism and its iterations in, in the West that probably provokes us today. And I say this because we now sit at a moment where we are told there's a return to the state, as if the state had disappeared for the last 40 years. But let's just play along. A return to the state in the US, a return to the state in the UK, um, where the state will come back and provide certain things, most likely heavily dominant forms of security that have underpinned the last 20 to 30 years, but even more ramped up. What does the relationship between the return to the state, um, Biden's ideas of buying American, Boris Johnson's idea of leveling up, tell us about the ideas of fascism that underpin the Western social order? What is the future of fascism um, beyond even its expression, say, as Trumpism, but maybe as a more mediated form of, of social democracy? And then finally, and I'll keep my intervention short and sweet so we can, we can talk more. I think Cedric's work always forces me to think about the horizon. Because if the revolutionary subject that Western Marxism had promised would deliver, which unfortunately never delivered, um, what is the horizon that we should all be heading towards? And in some ways, what Cedric's work does is to force us to recalculate the hopes and dreams of the horizon into the subjects um, that we don't normally see as the revolutionary subject, right? Those on the periphery, those with a revolutionary consciousness that doesn't simply match up to the idea of an urban proletariat. How does that make us think about our future? How does it make us think about the horizon that we may want to um, replace capitalism with or negate capitalism with? What does that do for our purposes? And I think, that for me is the, sy the synergy that I've always found in Robinson's work and the work that emanates from the Institute of Race Relations, specifically the work of Simon Andon, is that faith in the, in the masses or what Simon Andon called the communities of resistance. Um, not so much the leaders of those movements, but necessarily the people. Where are the people taking us? What are their hopes? Where are their dreams? Where are they pushing us towards? How do, how do they not resemble the traditional ideas of revolution? And how do they make us rethink um, where we're going? And I think that for me is the kind of key contribution I've always taken from Cedric Robinson's work. How does that, how do we move beyond a simple idea of revolution after we understand that the world and the mirror of production is not so just a simple reflection? Um, how do we keep our faith with the masses? And I think it would be just remiss not to say that having read Cedric's work, it would be interesting. He, he, he would probably be seeing the intellectual biography of myself is really, is really just a reflection of the intellectual biography of the masses, the people who push us forwards towards a better future. So I, I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you, John. Um, I'm gonna follow on from John now. I'm very pleased to be part of this launch of Josh's new biography. He's really um, blazed the trail with some terrific research. So first, Josh, 
Thanks for including me today in Africa World Now for hosting us. And second, um, congratulations, well done. Judging by the audience today, it will be well read, which is really just, just wonderful. I met Cedric and Elizabeth in 1990 when I moved to Santa Barbara to teach at the university. And we've been friends, colleagues, Cedric and I co-chairs of dissertation committees and with Elizabeth co-producers of a weekly public affairs radio program ever since. And it was in fact for me through the Robinsons that I first met Siva and everybody else at the Institute, even though I was here, here I'm in London right now, active politically in the UK um, in the late 70s while studying the history, uh, studying history at Warwick. So uh, it's interesting to come back at it from now. Okay, there's been a lot said already, um, but in my short time, I want to make a couple of points. And um, yeah, we'll see how they go. So the first one is that um, I have found it striking that Cedric, who was not recognized or appreciated except by a very small group of people for most of his life, has now become most well known for inventing or theorizing something called racial capitalism. And um, not just leaving aside for the moment the way the term has now sometimes been used as a kind of slogan or empty signifier or kind of neutered academic object, which is not the case at all in Josh's book, but is uh, something I think in happening elsewhere. I find this a little worrisome because it seems to me to misunderstand its place in Cedric's thinking especially in Black Marxism, the book for which he is now, now famous. And some of you will remember the first line of the original preface, a very Cedric line. It reads, it is always important to know what a book is about, not just what has been written in it. Um, so as you've already, I think, heard from, from John and Josh already before me, Black Marxism is very much about the making of the Black radical tradition or the black radical internationalist tradition, I like Barbara Ransby's term, I think it's more accurate, um, about the making of this tradition and the nature of what Cedric called its collective intelligence. The book asks why Marxism was so blind to both black radicalism and the racialism of, of Western civilization. It makes a historical argument about the European origins of European racism and the racial directions taken by European capitalism as it developed, and it analyzes the emergence and forms black radicalism took in the Americas, the Caribbean, and parts of Europe. Western civilization was from its origin, Cedric argues in the book, bound to racial constructs and antagonisms, which then determined the direction and nature of capitalism. This was a point upon which Cedric always insisted that capitalism is a product of Western civilization, not the way around. To my mind, what's crucial about the focus on racial capitalism in, in the book, why it matters is because first it is to use Cedric's term, the cauldron in which the radical tradition was distilled. And second, it's a blind spot in Marxism that radical black intellectuals will have to contend with. The historical argument about racial capitalism was excavated and quite laboriously, it takes up almost two thirds of the book. It was excavated to account for black radicalism, not the other way around. And as an experiment, you might try reading the book from back to front and you might see what I mean. That's conceptually how Cedric wrote it and how he would teach it. The genealogy or the counter history that's presented in Black Marxism, as I try to outline in the preface to an anthropology of Marxism is, is based in a, in a distinct historical materialism, this is something of what John was getting at, that is grounded in the primacy of social struggle and in a dialectic of what Cedric called power and resistance to its abuses, not 
really so much grounded in capitalism or the mode of production. This historical materialism, I think not racial capitalism per se, is what drives the revisionist account of the rise of the West in the excavation of the tradition in black Marxism. It also reappears in an anthropology of Marxism where it does rebuke Marxism's limitations on the ground, and I quote Cedric here, that domination and oppression inspire an irrepressible socialism generated by peasants, slaves, workers, and intellectuals in both the metropole and the periphery. Cedric said it didn't matter where. It opens and defines black movements in America where Cedric writes, quote, when black resistance surfaced, its character insinuated itself into the unstable contradictions of an immigrant slave servant in imperial social order, a cauldron, again, that word, in which slaves, indigenous peoples in the Euro-American poor had to be deliberately and violently pried apart. And it is given expression later in that book, Black Movements, when Cedric uses Fanon's words to describe the cultures of Black radicalism in the United States. And here's Cedric quoting Fanon. He says, it was not, Fanon wrote, the organization of production, but the persistence and organization of oppression, which formed the primary social basis for revolutionary activity. My point here is this, if racial capitalism is decontextualized from the historical materialism in which Cedric embedded it, it loses the analytic, the political, the ethical meaning that it had for him, and I think also then the meaning it would have for us, because this historical materialism foregrounds the oppressed, whomever they are, and their social struggles. It foregrounds intersectionality, of social struggles, intersectionality of social struggles, intersectionality of justice, not just identities. It foregrounds solidarity, transnationalism, and something Cedric called consciousness and culture. Racial capitalism deserves the attention it's getting now, quite a lot, it's interesting work going on and really deepening this concept. But I think if it's gonna be tied to Cedric, it needs to kind of know its place so to speak, and where it comes from, from him. Um, and my second point, I'll make a brief second point is this, um, please keep reading, those of you who especially are coming to Cedric's work new. Black Marxism was published in 1983 by Zed Press, and it was first reissued with the help of Robin Kelly, but not rewritten in the year 2000. None of the other new editions, and there are a couple at least, have been rewritten. Black Movements in America was published in 1997, and then the Anthropology of Marxism in 2001, quite some time actually after it was finished. These works effectively completed by the late 1990s form a kind of trilogy and are worth very much, I think, reading as such, but, or, and, while Cedric continued to teach this material periodically, his main research and teaching was focused on the problem of race, ideology, and culture, specifically in film and theater, which Colin has pointed out, he started publishing essays on in the early 1980s, actually. He was also an avid reader of mystery and detective fiction. He wrote an essay on Pauline Hopkins um, shortly before he passed away. And I believe that he planned for further writing on black detectives, black detective fiction. And of course he co-produced Third World News and Review every week for over 30 years. Um, in my opinion, not enough attention has been paid to this research and writing, including his last book published in 2007, Forgeries of Myth and Meaning, Blacks in the Regimes of Race in American Theater and Film Before World War II. In this book, Cedric explicitly articulated his very important notion of a racial regime that, and I'm quoting Cedric now, unstable and chaotic, makeshift patchwork of race masquerading as memory and the immutable, which justifies relations of power, unquote. And in that book, he analyzed the ways capital determined the construction of successive racial regimes publicized by film in its early years. There is in the book an argument about the relationship between capitalism, race, and culture, 
which was his last major published word on the question, and I think that deserves engagement. There is also an opening with the idea of racial regimes to go back to Black Marxism and look at those four moments of European racialism that he sketches at the end of chapter three, and his point that everyone incorrectly starts at moment three, the incorporation of African, Asian, and Native American peoples into the world system of merchant capital that has implications that Cedric identified then, and I think very much now today. Racial regimes, Cedric argued, though they are designed to create natural histories, change or mutate. They're not just one of them, they change and mutate over time because they degenerate. And one reason, not the only reason, but one reason they degenerate is because they exclude parts of reality that destabilize the purposes to which they are put. And one reality that has consistently destabilized racial regimes is of course the black radical tradition. As Cedric wrote in Black Marxism, and I quote, the black radical tradition casts doubt on the extent to which capitalism penetrated and reformed social life and on its ability to create entirely new categories of human experience stripped bare of consciousness and culture. You might recall the most important if kind of pithy sentence in all of black Marxism in which Cedric writes, the cargo had consciousness. The consciousness of a fugitive reality in which, of course, many of us live in the midst of a racialized and gendered capitalism is one Cedric was, was always at pains to share. It is also a consciousness made in culture and a consciousness buffeted and surrounded by culture industries whose role in shoring up collapsing racial regimes and inventing new ones is even more pronounced maybe now 10 years plus after Forgeries was published. It, it could be, this is a bit of a prov provocation, we'll see, it could be that it is perhaps this book in which films such as D.W. Griffith's 1915 film, Birth of a Nation, in which films such as that, that helped to publicize a new post-slavery racial regime of what Cedric called virile whiteness that hysterically promised to suture political economic crisis to the fortunes of a violent and fragile ethno-nationalism. It may be that this book might be most relevant today, and here Don's points about fascism are, are well taken, in which, of course, masquerades of national identity and populist presidential or prime ministerial power are now relayed according to very sophisticated media logics that do very similar work for similar ends as the early film did. So I'll just stop there. That's I think enough from me at the moment and look forward to the discussion and questions and conversations from, from the audience. So thank you, Elizabeth, I pass it on to you. Thank you, Avery. Thank you all. And uh, first of all, uh, what the task I was given to sort of round this up is impossible. So forgive me if I just blow off the, the charge because uh, it's just too much, too much, too much. But it is important to acknowledge Josh's work and the pleasure it's been for me to work with him through time uh, as he was doing this work even as I knew it was probably be a total embarrassment or something of an embarrassment to Cedric for people paying that much attention uh, to him. So I thank Josh, first of all, I've uh, had fun again uh, encountering all of the people that I have encountered and there are many of them uh, recognized in this work. Uh, particularly, I'd like to thank Josh uh, for his inclusiveness of me, I guess, as much as anything, to say I had a conversation with someone recently who also is a partner of a very big uh, persona who said to me something like, so what did they think we were doing all that time when these books were being written? Uh, and the answer, of course, is that we're part of them and that we were... Uh, 
part of this culture is an important part of what Josh has done here. Before going on, I always thank the Institute of Race Relations, the people who have been acknowledged. I don't know all of you anymore, but I would have to acknowledge Ginny Bourne, Hazel Waters, Liz Fakete, and uh, a number of other people who are no longer there. But uh, if you looked at their uh, release, there was a wonderful photo that gives a sense of the range of people who are part of IRR. And um, to thank, of course, uh, the people from uh, Africa World Now for what they've done here. I wanna just say two or three things because this is meant to be about our time in the UK uh, or the not, not United K. Um, and the stunning part of it beginning I think when we first got to England in 1970 uh, was that we encountered a household that we were sort of randomly sent to that included the Irish Nigerian Dominic Sankey, of course, and his mother um, who was an extraordinary person, but it included, and I'm not gonna name everybody, it included an Iranian, it included a Lebanese uh, young man, a Liberian, a Malaysian, uh, and so on. And in some ways, uh, uh, in some way made manifest uh, the conditions and the communities that we'd come in contact in our various uh, stays in England, uh, particularly. So the richness of culture is something that Cedric is always recuperating, I think, in his work, was always recuperating. And uh, people ask, you know, was he a historical materialist or was he not? And the, the question has to be reframed or the answer has to in, at least say, well, yeah, that too. But the richness of culture is something that I think was very much a part of his being always. So uh, those first months in the UK included, <clears throat> excuse me, finding out that a friend had been excluded from the University of Sussex graduate program because he had the temerity to suggest that there was such a thing as African history from an other than colonial perspective. So the, you know, the door was simply shut on him and his academic career. Realizing things like that uh, is, you know, stuff we knew about racism in the US, we know about uh, so much of this, but to be confronted with it in a different context um, and to have to grapple with it with people, which we did uh, in our house uh, on uh, various and sundry places is really important. And that was also a part of the work that we did with IRR. And I wanna just say, a couple things about IRR right now, the Institute of Race Relations, because I also, uh, while Cedric was walk, uh, writing Black Marxism, I was doing things like participating in what the collective was doing in creating uh, what would now be called a graphic book that uh, was entitled, I think I've got this right, Colin, you can correct me surely, um, how racism came to Britain. And uh, that's at a moment when people are saying not how racism came anywhere, but they, in the UK, we're still talking about the race problem as something that uh, emanated from the black population, people of color, the various, uh, uh, parts of the colony that of the colonial enterprise that had uh, come undone in so many ways. So um, 
they were always interested in, as was Cedric, with not only uh, writing things for intellectuals, for universities, but also for kids, for young people, however we want to uh, talk about them. And I think Josh captures some of that as well. Um, so yes, Cedric's relatedness to places and people is uh, always there for me and something that I'm enjoying once again. Uh, secondly, I just have to do a very, very quick gloss on, on Colin's uh, telling of a story about a VC. The VC was in fact the chancellor of the university. And this man who was an African, Africanist, an African historian, uh, was also very much part of the colonial uh, worldview. And I don't remember exactly what Colin said, but whatever it was led the, uh, chan the chancellor to put his hand on Colin's shoulder and say something like, my dear boy, and to then try to correct Colin. Colin did not respond in my uh, memory at that moment, but before he finished, he found occasion to put his hand on the vice chan on the chancellor's uh, shoulder as well and playfully shoved him, uh, but also made an important point. I think those are things that uh, are all bound up and I'm doing it in not theoretical ways. That's not my job. I'm doing it in the people ways. Uh, and in some sense, maybe the journalistic ones, which are always the places that uh, I rest. Um, so, um, John, I don't know you, or I've only just met you. Um, and really appreciated your comments, uh, particularly uh, saying things like uh, the idea of the revolutionary being mirrored, not having a, a particular substance that we sometimes think it does, uh, and uh, reminding us that um, Black Marxism wasn't about Black Marxists, please. <laughs> um, and finally, the thing that I think he does that Josh does in the book as well is he said something about, we must think about the horizon. And Josh and I talked about this, other people and I have talked about it. The idea that this is, um, that black Marxism particularly is a kind of, I don't know what, uh, a Bible. That's what it, that's the most, that's the scariest part. And so uh, everything is set in stone and you can agree with it or not, but it's uh, just out there. Uh, I think that is not uh, ever Cedric's intention and that his intention in writing this, his heavily footnoted books was to be able to say to people, uh, this is your resource. Uh, this is not the truth. This is where you can maybe go to find your truth or to correct my uh, misapprehensions. And I got to say, Josh <laughs> has uh, almost a quarter of this book is footnotes. So it's a fine tradition uh, that we have to, to uh, you too. Um, Finally, I wanted to say, and Avery has said some of it because we have a long and deep and frequent still relationship, uh, that when HLT Kwan, HQ and I were putting together the collection of essays uh, entitled, I think I'll get it right, Cedric Robinson on racial capitalism, Black internationalism and cultures of resistance. The last two parts are things that I and we insisted on because uh, at this moment, particularly, 
there is woeful ignorance of what's happening in most of the world from this point of view or this location, going back to uh, Josh's notion of locations. Um, and more than the depredations to and about cultures of resistance, uh, sustain all of us and uh, more than just sustain us. So I want to stop uh, by acknowledging that, but also by saying, um, as uh, Avery did, and this may be just a conceit because I do media, but I want you to be familiar with this book and Forgeries of Memory and Meaning, the Regimes of Race in America, in American theater and film, sorry, before World War II, uh, tells us so much about the crap that we're being fed today. And I actually cleaned that language up a little bit. But it is available um, and it is um, a kind of amazing compendium, not only because it focuses on media, but because it focuses on the intentionality of media, the degree to which those folks were, who are making those movies, those folks who were writing those or, or owning those presses and so on had a very particular intention. And it was pretty much, you could say, racist and to be fought against. And it was, and it is, and I thank you all. One. And James is uh, bringing us all back on screen and I'm gonna hand off to you once again. Thank you. You're still muted. Ah, there we go. John, you're muted. James is muted. Can you hear you, James? James, you're still muted. There you go. I'm unmuted now? Yes. No. Oh, okay. great, yes. great. Yes. I'm so sorry. Technology, my screen is frozen, so I'm just pressing <laughs> buttons. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, thank you very, very much uh, for this rich conversation. Um, and, and again, I want to invite uh, listeners. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, listeners, I'm on the radio. I want to invite people who are viewing um, this on YouTube and also um, those who are on this platform. So please uh, submit your questions. I wanted to just open up a space before I kind of throw something out here, but I wanted to open up space for anyone to, um, to comment or to reflect upon anything that anyone has said at this particular moment uh, before I throw some out. You guys just want me to kind of shake the tree a little bit. Shake the tree? Okay. <laughs> One of the things that and 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 Elizabeth, thank you so much for really kind of um, you know making a comment or, or, or wrapping this up. And and Avery did a good job in this as well. And of course, Colin um, um, and John that really talks about uh, what Cedric Robinson was an identifying was a tradition. Um, there's a there there is a process here, a tradition within which. Uh, uh, resistance. He was trying to identify that, to pose questions, not as as uh, um, Elizabeth just said, to be the Bible. And I think that that was a very, very important comment. But I wanted Josh uh, to really situate this notion of time. Talk a little bit of more about the concept of time and why that was important, because I think that that's the strand of the of being able to understand the collective consciousness, the collective consciousness rooted in resistance. Why did you do that? But also, John, you mentioned this notion of the futurity. Where was his work going? And of course, Avery and Elizabeth talked about his, his much neglected work 
um, of, of of the media. Can you can you guys kind of jump in in that particular um, in any way? We'll start with Josh, and then we'll kind of go. I guess uh, on my screen, I see Elizabeth, Avery. Then we'll go to Colin, and then John will be last. So, I mean, there are, there are a number of ways, you know, to you know respond to that idea about time. And I guess for me, there's, there's just this, that moment in Black Marxism was so foundational. It was in chapter eight, right? Where he's building this bridge between the historical archeology span of the Black radical tradition and the Black radical intelligentsia. And he seizes on not just the time that they emerged, which is the 19th century writ large, but the relationship that they had to that particular historical archeology. span And that just opened things up for me in terms of conceiving of what was at stake, conceiving of how um, the intellectuals understand uh, what's at stake. And um, he writes, and once that, once that opened up, I found other places, for instance, um, the interview with, with uh, Chuck Morse in Perspectives on Iraq, mm -hmm. 1990, mm -hmm. um, where he talks about uh, community, community, communal notion of having your name repeated as a way to ensure um, that uh, you are remembered by history and its relationship to time. Um, there's a section of an article that he wrote in the 1970s um, called Time, History, and Western Civilization. We're just having that conversation again, but this time through Cabral and others who are thinking about this. And so it, it recalled for me uh, the work of Gunseki Fukia, uh, the Congolese uh, scholar and um, Congolese traditionalist who was initiated in four different traditions in the Congolese and his insistence uh, that we see time as cyclical, that we see our relationship to each other. And, 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 not, and not to say that history repeats, but history is how we see what happened to other people in the past so that we might be able to understand our human challenges in the future. Um, and Fukiao, who some may know, uh, we've read uh, the work of Robert Ferris Thompson, um, is one of the informants that inspires uh, Thompson's reading of Afro-American art. Um, but he was more than that. He uh, lectured, he came to the United States and he engaged with the black community here. He lectured in prisons, in fact, um, in Suffolk County, uh, Massachusetts, I think. Um, but he was, a, he was a really important influence in me. And that's, where I, that's why I started the book there because reading those two people together helped me understand more about the black radical tradition than I can even fully explain. Um, I think, you know, earlier this year when we, were, we did a clubhouse event, the way that I framed it there was that, you know, this, this work holds up a mirror to me um, to see myself and to see the many generations of people that made me possible. And so that for me was the, was, the, was one frame. I wouldn't say it's the best frame, but was one frame for helping us to kind of enter into uh, the many people that made Cedric's life possible. Uh, which is why we had to do what we did in chapter one in terms of his family, um, who we didn't talk about much today. You know, Colin mentioned Cap uh, Whiteside, Winston Whiteside. Uh, Cedric called him Daddy Whiteside. And uh, his wife, uh, Cecilia Mamadou, uh, Cedric's aunts, uh, particularly uh, Elizabeth, um, told me about the influence of Aunt Wilma, um, Cedric's cousins. Um, all the people that were in that house, those are the people that were in his circle that helped them understand that there's a time outside of this house and there's a time within this house, right? How do we understand how we relate to each other in this house so that we can navigate and better survive what happens outside of this house? And so, again, those are some of the things that would have inspired me to think about um, Cedric's work, Black radicalism, uh, through this lens of time. I think I meant to go ahead and I will. And I, <laughs> talking about time is always kind of an amazing thing. It makes a, a song run through my head that went something like time brings about a change, even though I'm losing you. And 
uh, also uh, about things like um, a book entitled Time Longer Than Rope, and I can't think who wrote it, but it's about African concepts of time. Uh, but what I would say in this context, thinking about the UK, when we first came to the UK, as you may know, I'm Arab American, but I knew nothing or very little about an accurate history of what was going on in Palestine. Um, and it was in these trips that I first began, began to understand uh, the parallels between Palestine and the US or between uh, the US and South Africa and so on. Um, but also I think at the, our first encounters with the Institute of Race Relations, things like the question of Palestine had not yet been taken up or was just being taken up. And I think that's extremely important because if we're gonna understand race of, racism at all, we have to understand that it moves with amazing alacrity. And uh, as a group called the Watts Prophets used to say, or used to sing, me today, you tomorrow, uh, as evidence of that. So that's all I'll, I'll say right now about time. But um, yeah, Josh, hang in there with that. Um, yeah, so I think this is an interesting question and Josh didn't read it. The first line of Josh's book is that the Congo peoples of West Central Africa saw life as a cycle. And I think for me, there are two issues around time just to, to say something about. One is that, um, I mean, Cedric very much starting with terms of order was making a critique of linear, rational, progressive, law-based time um, as a fundamental form of Western order. And so there, there is a political epistemological critique of conventional notions of Western time um, from the point of view of a more cyclical, a more uh, liminal, a more um, present into the past, into the future, merging sense of, of temporality that comes to take political form in how we might think about um, a sort of transnational with the more interesting queer notion of trans now, um, with that meaning to the word transnational, I think, form of solidarity. And the and I think Cedric was very much involved in that. That's all we've been describing elements of that um, earlier today. And I mean, the close, the probably the person who most articulates that in the most accessible way is Martin Luther King, with his notion of the indivisibility of justice, you know, and then justice everywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And that sense that we are, as he says, caught in this inescapable network of mutuality that we are um, part of a single, he says, garment of destiny. Um, so where, you know, um, what affects one directly affects all indirectly, that notion of time um, where it's interwoven into a sense of solidarity and resistance, I think was very much in Cedric's practice and in his heart, how he, how he worked. The other thing that's interesting about, about time is more conventionally that Cedric was trained in political theory, but um, really did so much of his theoretical work via history. Mm -hmm. And so that there's that sense of time as the discipline, you know, history as a discipline of time um, and how that becomes a medium for theorizing in Cedric. Like that's how he comes to do political theory after terms of order. And even there, it's, it's, it's there too. So, um, so I think Josh is right to highlight that as such a central concept and frame mm -hmm. in thinking Cedric's work. Um, so yeah, I'll just stop there. Carly. 
Colin, I think it's your turn. Carl, Carl, yes, Colin. And everybody can me? hear me, correct? Okay. Yes, okay, yes okay, it's you. Okay, yes, okay. yes. <laughs> can, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I want to go to yes. another place on time. Uh, Cedric does this to me a lot. I read him uh, almost intuitively. I read him uh, associatively. And all the talk about time, wonderful. I'm really... I'm really grateful for the conversation that you've admitted to here. And uh, Josh, you've called it in a way. Uh, time takes me to another way of coming at it. As I read your book, Josh, as I thought about Cedric and what he was talking about exactly around this notion of time, I recall that, and you may have done it too, the number of occasions I've been in serious black campaign, black resistance meetings, and somebody, an elder usually, uh, gets up and says, starts the meeting, by saying, I want us to remember the ancestors. I remember as a young man thinking, and there's, it's usually often accompanied by a libation ceremony, something. Uh, water won't usually do, it usually has to be something hard, hard alcohol of some sort. I grew up with this in the Caribbean. I came here, I mean, this is before I got here, as a boy, I was a boy in the Caribbean, I came here when I was 13. Uh, but here I notice that in the radical tradition meetings in the occasions when they've been struggling, people often begin in this kind of way. I said, and I can almost remember the moment when I came out of my uh, secularized, my, uh, my educated position thinking, this is just, my grandmother said, this is just simi dimi, simi dimi. Yes, I used to, uh, <laughs> they're, they're playing games here. Uh, to thinking, hold on, Colin, take a, take a charge of yourself. Take, take, the, take, take, take us people, your people seriously. Actually, that is not Simidimi. What is being called here is for you to remember those who came before and what they did and how they, what they did and what they said instructs us now. Connect to that. Know that this is the authority that you stand on. And as I read your book, this is, this, is, this is what I kept thinking all the way through. This book has already referred to all the people you've managed to, Josh, in your book, to just, to just lay out, mm -hmm. really everybody's there. I know that not everybody's there, but it feels like everybody's in there. Uh, mm -hmm. They're the people who are all part of the movement that Cedric was picking up on, that he's responding to, that he was being provoked by, and all the rest of it. And that's where we are. That's the time that we're in, yes? Uh, but the, the, the notion of standing on the shoulders of those who went before is like that. But this notion of, of remembering the ancestors is what came to me strongest of all. And I realized that I was in discourse about time. Hmm. That's my response. No more. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'll pick up from that. I. I... I was when you read Josh's book, there's that wonderful uh, recollection of, of, and I guess Elizabeth would tell us more about the Robinson household being a kind of conduit for the community that had built up around Cedric's scholarship, but also the activism um, over the years. And, and I think that, in a sense, is part of that Black radical tradition is the community choosing to remember its place in the history of the community, right, at that various juncture. How do we place ourselves within that struggle? But also how then do those memories recall strategies, ways of living, ways of being that help us inflect our present moment, right? And, I, and then that history isn't linear because that history is itself fought over, struggled uh, to, to be recollected correctly. And I think it's really done well in a different book, which isn't about the black radical tradition, but in the anthropology of Marxism, where, right, socialism, those of us who are animated by this, this concept, uh, or dare I say even communism, Cedric reveals a kind of history that we had forgotten, that we as a community of socialists had forgotten and didn't remember. Um, and I remember reading it going, wow, this is amazing. Right? Again, another thing that wasn't in print that has only just come back into print. Thank goodness people have brought it back into print. Um, and that, that different relationship with time, that time even the act of remembering the ancestors isn't linear, that there are exclusions, there are specters haunting what we, what we are calling for. And that at times we have to pay attention to, to how we are even recalling our linkages with the past, I think is, is really kind of a present thing and something that really gets us to kind of think about in our present moment, how are we remembering who we are, who we are, right? Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. 
No, thank you. And thank you very much. Um, and as you can probably imagine, uh, the questions are now popping. <laughs> um, so uh, what I wanted to do is just kind of integrate some of them in there. Uh, but I do want to take a little bit of uh, a little bit of uh, just a little bit of privilege to kind of push on this notion of time, Josh, because you really the reason why I wanted to talk about this is because this notion of looking at time differently, deconstructing and uh, this notion of a linear time becomes important because this is allows us to see the tradition, the radical tradition, the ways of being, the forms of knowledge within which Africana people were engaged in. On a on an everyday basis, whether it was a, a a little instance or a big instance of mass movement, it allows us to be able to see that. So, could you could you could you press that a little bit a little bit for me? Because again, I'm I'm kind of mapping your 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 book here, but we'll I'll stop with my questions and integrate everybody else's questions in, into this. But please, by all means, jump off there, and then you anybody can kind of freestyle after that um, as far as jumping in. Well, I think it's something that Elizabeth always said that the work was about uncovering the thing that was erased, right? And so part of the, and Avery mentioned this as well, part of it is, is upending historiography as a Western practice in order to get at the erased, in order to get at the thing that was covered up purposely by that same historiography, which of course is a daunting task for anybody to take up, take upon, especially when you consider the fact that um, to the right history is to be beholden to the archive, right? And so it's also about taking what's not in the archive and trying to historicize that, which is only possible if you, as Du Bois um, once said, it's only possible if you knew people, if you know people, if you have a relationship. Du Bois has something um, that I'm actually currently writing on uh, in, uh, that was never published story, um, a book called Pan-Africa, the story of a dream. It's a beautiful title. <laughs> um, but he says, what's the, relation, the relationship between a dream and empiricism? It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> and he's, he begins by saying that it was when I was young, when I was a young person in the 19th century, the idea that African people could be free of colonialism was, was our dream. When, I write, when I'm writing this, it is now a fact, 1961, right? So he's writing this at the end of his life and he says, our dream became real. And so in, in the midst of that, he said, I knew that my dream could be true in the 19th century. I knew that my dream could be made concrete in the 19th century because I knew the people. And so when I say relationships, Part of this is going back to Mobile, Alabama. Part of it is going to West Oakland. And I wasn't able to actually physically go to Mobile, but I did go to West Oakland and I did retrace the steps and, and try to get a sense of something that I said in my initial comments of the feeling that must have been there. It's not, of course, going to be there fully in 100% in the way that it was in 1940, but I wanted to try to feel it. I wanted to try to get that because in order to write about it, I had to find a way to relate to it. And I think that's the same thing that's happening in Cedric in chapter six of Black Marxism and many other places, writes about um, the Black radical tradition, those acts of resistance, those events, those episodic moments of resistance. It's not just you know reporting from the archive. It's not just narrating in a historiographical way, it's doing something else. And that something else is, is so hard to quantify and describe and explain, but that something else is what makes it feel different for us. And he does it, of course, um, in Black movements in America where he actually talks about his family in that particular text, um, even though he doesn't acknowledge that this is my grandfather that I'm writing about as, this, as an example of what I'm trying to say, but it's there and because it's there, it's available for us to feel too. And, I, and I'm thinking that um, that empirical intervention is made possible by something much larger than the tools of the empirical social scientist. And that's what I'm trying to get at. 
Elizabeth, uh, did you want to did you want to comment on this? And and also we'll go to Avery, then Colin, then John. I'm sorry, James. Do you want? Are you asking? Do I want to comment further on time? Well, no, the, no. The and, idea, the idea of the of the question of the the notion of deconstructing this linear process of time. Because the reason why I say this is because you were you were there. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were there you saw all of this you engaged into this you know and I'm, I'm sure you influenced that thought process of course we know this we know you did influence uh, that particular process thank you very much I'll be really brief I think that's true Cedric always acknowledged me as his first editor probably not realizing that I didn't understand most of what he was writing but I was a good grammarian thanks to some nuns somewhere, right? Uh, but I think uh, this whole, um, I'm also reading some of the comments, so I'm going to throw something in about this. You know, people are always asking, so what should we do in some ways? And most of us can't answer that for one another, but there are many ways in which we can engage uh, Cedric, to my knowledge, never did a lot around reparations, for instance, which is one of the questions. Um, and uh, although I feel very confident, he would have said, but of course, what are you talking about? Uh, how you do that is something else again. Um, I think early on, Cedric was paying attention to uh, the uh, excesses of policing and of uh, prisons. And if you're looking for somewhere to grab hold of something to be engaged in, those are things that need and demand immediate sorts of attention. So with that, I'm gonna stop because I wanna, uh, I, I, was, I was there <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, am very cherry of speaking for Cedric, uh, generally speaking. But uh, yes, I think there are those things that I'm quite comfortable with assuming he'd be on board with. And I also wanted to uh, amend my statement that you weren't just there, you were active. So, <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. Uh, you know, for Avery, uh, did you want, uh, please, of all means, I don't think I have much more to add here. I think um, I feel, Josh, that part of what you're getting at is um, something about who Cedric as a person was that you're um, trying to locate and find um, through, you know, the experience of his life that you weren't part of, um, mm -hmm. and that. I mean, not neither Elizabeth and I, Colin, people have known him a long time. I mean, we weren't there when he was a boy either. So there's some of that. I mean, I'm really reminded of, um, of Toni Morrison's notion of rememories, um, you know, where you can go to a place and experience what never happened to you, that the memory is there waiting for you. And I feel like part of your research methodology was to be really open to that possibility of being not just haunted, but to encounter those, those rememories and see where they took you in the making of the life story. And so it's different. I feel like it's a little bit different for me, obviously Elizabeth, Colin, but especially Elizabeth and I spent a lot of time with Cedric over the last 30 some odd years where you're, you're with the man, you know him, you have a sense of him, the, the seriousness of the ideas, the goofiness of other aspects of him. I mean, he had, in my view, appalling taste in television, the, um, you know, <laughs> what he liked to eat, what he, um, you know, I mean, I said he liked to read detective fiction while Elizabeth and I could regale you with stories about those books and being up at four o'clock in the morning. I mean, there's the man who is a person and, and, and he was, um, I think what Colin said about him is really, really correct. Um, he was um, 
both very dignified and also someone who was not at all invested in professional reward. And so he didn't orient his thinking, writing, working life towards that. Um, and um, lived a very, um, a life that was very active and present in his local milieu and community. It wasn't like somewhere else was better and more important. Um, and so partially what you're, I, I feel like what you're, what you're trying to conjure, what you're trying to get at is um, this person who you also heard about from his students, from the people who knew him, the generosity, the graciousness, the person who was there for every struggle, um, you know, um, who could be extremely sharp and, and cutting if he felt the analysis wasn't right, but who at, the, at, at other points was just amazingly open and welcoming and, you know, facilitated also infrastructurally very much by Elizabeth. So what, what I feel is important here is not the abstract concepts, but the politics as a way of life, um, how we live, how we bring our standpoints, our philosophies, our ideologies to bear in the living way in our actual relations and communities with others. And Cedric led a very beautiful life in that regard. And there's a deep lesson in that for everyone and for resistance movements today. He was not a sectarian. He was not, um, what is the council culture? I mean, he wasn't anything like that at all. Um, and so I, I don't know, that's what I feel like you're, you're talking about Josh and that's all I have to say about that more. <laughs> Colin, did you want it? Did you want it to add to this? It, you're muted. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry to uh, delay. And it's for very something very brief. Uh, I'm, I'm following Avery, and I'm following, uh, and I'm following Elizabeth. And, and I'm grounding myself in the conversation because to say to me, talk about time in, in, uh, with Josh is to make me want to take off. I mean, I, I, I could see Josh taking off too, but I'm going to ground myself. Uh, the last time I think I talked about time in some part of the sense you're talking about, I was doing it to a bunch of kids around the corner from here. I work a lot locally, teenagers uh, talking to them about history, in fact. And there came a point in the conversation where I said to them, listen, I will, I, I, for me, what I did with time was I want to, I, I tried to throw them into time, throw, the, throw themselves into time. History, I said, you're in it. You're part of it. That attempt by me to talk about past, present, future as something that's doing that, you are in history at the point which they came to talk about, is as close as I get to, I think, dealing with the mysteries of what uh, Cedric is reaching for when, uh, when Josh says he talks about time. Because I really mean it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a commonplace. You don't have to go very far. It's commonplace to know that the present we're living in has all this past in it, you know, for Cedric to talk about the fact that feudalism, as the, as the, as the, 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 the old structures tried to talk about it, isn't something that went away when captains arrived. Yes, it continues to be inside of it. So that sense of things not passing because a, a chronology says, you know, this is, was to date it up is not on. So the, 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 the real sense, we all have it. The fact that what we're living in now is marked by the past, the tracks that are, that are laid out in the past. And what's going to happen next, yes, is influenced by what we, what we do now in terms of that thing that is past. See how that, how that moves around to the notion that you can put off like that. So the closest I get to it is talking to kids these days when I try to get them to have a sense of, if you like, the social archaeology of the spaces they're living in. You know, where you're standing now, you're standing in something that happened here before, and, you know, and what you're doing here will influence what happens next here. That is my sense. I'm sorry, I've gone on a long time, but it, it's I have a I'm trying to ground myself in the in the in the response to the question you're putting to me, uh, rather than to take off into heights where I can't talk to kids about this. <laughs> okay, sorry, that's it. No, that that that's wonderful. And 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 John, of course, we're going to come to you, but I want to wrap in, uh, uh, John, in your response to what was said, but also. As, as you can imagine, you know, this notion of racial capitalism, this is a reoccurring question in, in the chat and, and things like that. And one of the questions uh, is with understanding that uh, racial capitalism is becoming more widespread, 
how accurate do you think that these uh, understandings of racial capitalism are? Um, and also, how do you add in the, the, uh, the principle, as we call it, of gender in these questions of racial capitalism? Sorry, John, I had to throw this at you. <laughs> um, but go take a stab at it. Okay, I might need some, some time for that. Um, okay, okay. I, I, I don't want to just uh, repeat what has been said. I mean, it's amazing stuff about time. I would just say one thing that comes through in Josh's biography and obviously in Elizabeth's life is how time, if we talk about linear time, we could talk about time having a horizontal spread in the community that was formed around the Robinsons. I, I, I found the kind of, you know, the expressions of, so, you know, you have to name them as individuals, right? But the sheer amount of scholars and activists who were linked to, to Cedric uh, and Elizabeth, I felt time was flowing through that as a community. And I feel like that is a sense of time as well that we need to appreciate about how we, we live our lives linearly, linearly as individuals, but in a sense, there's a horizontal sharing of time with others, both with us right in the present and in that past. Right? And, and I, I, when I was reading the book, it, I don't know how idyllic it was. Elizabeth could tell me about it, about not, not, not locking the doors and stuff. But um, I, I just thought that that was wonderful. You know, like it was a homestead, to use that term. It was homestead, right? Uh, and we're all craving that. All right, in terms of racial capitalism, um, do I think the term... So it's a really interesting thing. The, the, I've read some really weird stuff. There was a piece written where they said, oh, well, Cedric Robinson, you know, had a different version of racial capitalism to the African inflection, and he wasn't so much like, concerned about Africa. And I was thinking, that's really weird. Um, <laughs> that's a really weird approach. The, I guess if we gave it a genealogy, I guess that term starts in South Africa. There's a famous... Uh, pamphlet by a couple of Marxists called Leg uh, Legacy and Hemson who, who talk about the political economy of racial capitalism. Some people then say, well, uh, Cedric Robinson's work isn't about political economy, it's political philosophy. But I, I mean, and I just gave a lecture on this two weeks ago. I think there is, a, you know, a coming together of these terms around what that differentiated economy, i.e. The, the, the idea of production not being just simply a mirror between wage, labor, and exploitation. There's a lineage that runs to that, well, what does that difference get us? And then of course, gender is key to that, um, that, that differentiated economy, just because of how gender is then used to reinforce the exploitation that comes out of that differentiated economy. Um, again, I know there's a critique of Cedric's work that says that, there, that there are not, the, the women are not the key characters in black Marxism. Again, I would push back slightly and say that's not so true. If you read the book, women are integral parts of that history. And I guess we're caught in a double bind of, of naming individuals when, look, I do a lot of work on the Black Panther Party and it's very you know, simple to say the Black Panther Party is, is misogynist and run by men. And then when you actually look at the history, all the men go to prison or are killed off and the women are running the party and running everything, right? And so we have these famous individuals, but these nameless women, these, those values of community, I think, come through. So on the flip side, gender is important and gender is also important to the black radical tradition, um, you know, integral to, to the ideas and values of that, of that black radical tradition that we've been talking about. It's not just a, a masculine project. Um, was that the last? That was the, there was nothing else, right? Did I deal with everyone? Yeah? yeah, I'll leave it there. You're mute. Can you hear me now? Okay, good. Yeah, my, my computer, I have no idea what's going on with my computer, but it still says mute on my computer and I'm clicking it and clicking it. Josh, did you want to respond? Did you want to respond to that uh, to that just now? And also I, I would love to hear um, Avery, and, um, uh, Avery um, respond as well on this. You know, I'm thinking about um, the many sides of the conversation um, that have emerged with respect to racial capitalism. And um, everything Avery said earlier is how I would say it. it's to me, um, 
I'm not sure how useful the debate is in the way that it's been framed and how it's been handed down in these past four or five years. And I say that, you know, fully aware that many people involved in the debate do believe or are committed to a revolutionary process, however they define it, right? So it's not a question of their commitments, but things it's, it's become something else because you don't see those commitments in the debate. You see a sort of need to be correct. And something about that doesn't resonate <laughs> with how I approach um, thinking about these questions and thinking about these ideas. And so that's what I, what I would say about that and just echo everything Avery said earlier. And um, with respect to the question of gender, gender is part of the architecture of racial capitalism. It can't be uh, distinguished from that. And um, we all, I think, Cedric concluded, um, needed to fully recognize that and write more about that and bring that conversation more directly to um, our teaching and in our ability to frame these questions. So um, in 20, when did Futures of Black Radicalism come out? 2017 or 2018? 2017, right. Um, the, the interview um, that uh, Jordan Camp and Christina Heatherton uh, published in that volume um, provided, I think, um, Cedric's most complete answer to that question and that critique. And um, he says in that interview that there have been scholars who have done that work, who have brought that analysis uh, to bear. And, you know, my response to that is, you know, acknowledge that this was a limitation, but also don't forget to cite those scholars that have <laughs> begun the work, continued the work of using the idea of a Black radical tradition as a point of departure to have those conversations. And so there are many scholars, one of the scholars that Cedric always taught was Jennifer L. Morgan. Um, and so that's my response to that. And I know Avery um, kind of summed it up uh, to read and read and read more, <laughs> to read more, but did you want to add a little bit, just a little bit more, or we can leave it at that as well too, if you like. Yeah, I just, I, I would just say a bit, just, just to reiterate what Josh said, because I'm also seeing comment in the chat to us about, um, you know, the, the missing presence of Claudia Jones and, um, you know, folks like that in black, black Marxism. And I, um, I think that, um, I think that Cedric um, understood that he might have had a stronger focus in black Marxism than he did. Um, and that really was corrected in um, anthropology of Marxism and in terms of order. I mean, I think he really, he really did, um, um, sort of try to do the citation, Josh, that you're talking about. And that is very much our responsibility too. It's not all on Cedric, it's on the rest of us to do it as well. Um, and, um, and I think that there's, um, um, you know, that, that development, that shift. Um, there's also, um, as Matt Harris has just put in the chat, you know, he says Cedric taught in the classroom. And I think that's a really crucial arena where Cedric was present as an intellectual and a writer and a scholar and a thinker and a, and a mentor and so on and so forth. And there, I mean, um, it was very present in part of his thinking and citational structure. Um, and so um, I think that's also just less visible if you weren't obviously in the, in the classroom with him. Um, but it's also good. There's a lot of work that folks can do, you know. Thank you. And thank you for that comment. And as we come to a close, um, I just wanted to give an opportunity and give space. Let me first thank everyone. And, and again, in a, in a, in an environment such as this, 
being able to engage everybody's questions is, you know, obviously challenging. And we, we would definitely love to kind of address them in a, in a different way, in a different way. But I wanted to give, uh, you know, each of you some closing comments. Uh, we'll start with Colin, um, then we'll go to uh, John, then we'll go to Avery, and then we'll go to Josh and then Elizabeth. Hello. Yeah. Didn't think I'd be put on this spot, James. Um, so I'll say something really quick and glib. Uh, I'm coming off uh, Avery, uh, who just said there's a lot of work that one can do, that we can do and must do. Uh, and I'm going to say something. It sounds like I'm on a, a, a platform making a speech. But for all that we're talking here wisely, thoughtfully, seriously, profoundly about these matters, um, about racism, about sexism and misogyny, uh, um, we haven't really been having enough effect, anything like it. I'm saying something really obvious. I have to say this here. It's not a small anecdote. There's a prime minister of our country right now in Britain where I am called Boris Johnson, who when I came off a platform, which I happened to share with him not very long ago, before he became prime minister, before he began this particular thing, one day said to me, looking at me in the face, you know, with this coloration, said to me, I don't understand why those people, we've been talking to some journalists and they were barracking me when I said that uh, uh, colonialism hadn't been entirely a bad thing. Um, and I said, I, 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 I tried to be really quiet. Because uh, I said, what are you saying to me? And he said, uh, take Africa, for example. There was, this is the Hegelian stuff, yes. There was nothing happening. This man's been to Oxford and, and Eton, so he's saying it with great assurance. Yes. There was nothing happening in that place uh, before, you know, uh, he didn't say we, but uh, the Europeans went in and, and shoved it and, and pushed it in some kind of way. This man's there. He's making silly jokes all the time. To the, in, in this in this in this place, he's running the running the, the the media politics of this society. People are listening to him. They're talking. They're talking about him as though he's some kind of wonderful magician. You know, he's he's channeling Winston Churchill, taking his people places. He's holding this stuff. The people who are being swayed by him, we are not reaching them. We're not touching them. It's not enough. We haven't been doing enough. That's my thing. I can do the same thing. I want to do the same thing. I don't, I don't want to take the time on misogyny and sexism and the, and the, and the asshole shit. I know I'm talking out of, out of term here that's going on uh, currently in our cultures. So Avery, I'm with you. There's a lot of work that we have to do, that one has to do uh, beyond, of course, encouraging ourselves by, the, by the, the company we're keeping in this moment, but there's a lot to be done. That's it. Thank you. Okay, uh, it's me, right? Um, how are we? I guess I'll build off what Colin was do saying, and I guess one of the things I would say is maybe I'm too optimistic. <laughs> but in a sense, when you know, and maybe I, when I read Cedric Robinson's work, I, I, I I'm always given hope and inspiration that that resistance is there that out there uh, is forms of humanity that refuse to be crushed. And I always recall that those, those kind of last couple of few pages in, in Black Marxism, when he talks about the kind of clock of Western civilization ticking and everything ticking down. Um, and he talks about that history of the tradition, but he says, you know, this isn't the only radical tradition. There are other traditions. There are other things that refuse to be uh, broken down. And they're the things that bind us together, maybe, right? In a refusal to be broken down, to be, uh, have their humanity disfigured or literally discolored. Um, and, and he has that phrase, you know, like, for now we are divided, but we have to be one. And that for me is the political project. I mean, how can we think of ways and living of being one, even if we are many? How do we become one? Um, and we will have to do that. And that, that's that future, right? I, I, when, I, when I was doing this talk, I was like, well, what does Robinson really tell me to do? And he tells me to think other than the future uh, 
uh, Western capitalism wants to give us, which may be the end of the world. He wants me to think of something else. Now, whether that's in the black radical tradition, which negates that and says, I don't want to, you know, Maroon is like, I'm not even going to engage with you. I'm going to leave. Um, or, whether, or maybe that's in the Fanonian tradition of thinking about leaving Europe and imploring comrades to head somewhere else. It's that, that we must be one going forward. So, and that's, that's what I always take from you said as well. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Yeah, that's really nice, John and Colin. Thank you. Um, all I want to say is that um, I just, just, I think this is to repeat something that Elizabeth said earlier. Cedric was not really very comfortable in the limelight. You know, he just, he never thought it was about him, but about what we ordinary people do to study, to fight back, to live as John suggested on better terms than we have uh, on offer now. And so, I mean, the best way to, I think, take his legacy forward is to do that. Um, and if, you know, reading him and um, uh, following his work helps, that's great. Um, but we also need to, we need to help ourselves and we need to be grounded in the struggle and the need um, that we have now. And so to the extent that Cedric can be helpful with that is great, let's bring him along. Um, but we have a commitment and a responsibility to the living now um, in relationship to our ancestors and a commitment to protecting our grandparents and our grandchildren. Um, and I think that's how I see Cedric um, like, like that. So, and again, I just wanna thank Josh for the book and really encourage people to read it. <laughs> thank you. So with all the good uh, Cedricisms already being, being covered, I was just gonna, I'm just gonna say thank you again um, to everybody assembled here, everybody in the panel and all the people that went into the making of, making of the text. Um, the people at Polity, all the way down, um, all the people uh, that interviewed, that I interviewed, um, some of whom haven't talked about Cedric in 45, 50 years, um, you know, some of his high school classmates, all the way to the, some of the people that, the last, some, some of the last people that he taught um, at, at Santa Barbara. And so it, it, to re reiterate, it really is about relationships and, and how those relationships uh, push us forward. So. Thank you so much for everybody um, who was a part of this. I'm not sure if we have time for a final word, but I wanna say something about the last trip to the UK was for the 100th anniversary of the film um, by, uh, well, oh, I'm going to blank on his name right now because it's just, that's me right now. Um, Oscar Birth Mitchell. of a Nation. Thank you. Uh, Cedric was invited to speak about another film, not about per se. And that was a rejoinder to Birth of a Nation, which debunked the characterization, the construction of racism uh, in that film which is still celebrated to this day. And uh, the film is by Oscar Michaud. Uh, it's entitled Within Our Gates. And it's the sort of thing that is being covered up as quickly as all of you who are doing work out there are uncovering it. So I think of Claudia Jones. Cedric may have known of Claudia Jones when he was writing Black Marxism, but she may also have been disappeared in the way so many and the work of so many has disappeared. So let's don't let them do that. And with that, of course, thanks and love to Josh and uh, to all of you out there and uh, James for organizing this. And of course, to my buddies at the Institute of Race Relations. I love you all. Thank you. And with that, we're coming to a close. Once again, thank you to IRR and Racing Class. Thank you to each and every one of you who, who, are, who are here with us today in community, uh, developing a collective consciousness to think about 
uh, the future through and with Cedric Robinson and the other people who informed Cedric Robinson's uh, paraxis as well. Again, with that being said, uh, uh, have a great week and we hopefully we can engage again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.